Okay, so now we are broadcasting and people are able to start joining us. And Ingrid, when we get to the, I'm gonna let you, or have you say hello to everybody um, once we start, and then we'll both turn off our videos when the recording starts so that they just see the recording during that. Okay, so I also have to stop my video. At that point, and I can stop it for you. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. That's easier, but then we'll need to come back on video after the recording for the Q and A. Yeah, yeah. And I'll mute my mic. Uh... Okay, great. Bruno, I did notice during the session on Saturday that it didn't appear to actually um, make a difference when I spotlighted people. Oh, it didn't? Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, I'm still kind of trying to figure it out. I think it only makes a difference if like there's nothing on the screen, I think. Like if it's yeah. just, yeah. So are we preferring to do that to stop sharing at that point? Um, I mean, it, it's varied, right? You know, like some people, I mean, some like, for example, like other presentations, like we do go back to spotlight, but like, I don't think it's the end of the world if like we don't. So it's, it's what I'll follow your lead, but I'm good with whatever. If you want to try it, we can, but it, it's not like, you know, make or break. I know if we stop sharing, then we'll see Ingrid on full, full video, right? Yes. If she's spotlighted and her camera's on, we would see her full screen, correct? Okay. <laughs> I'll wing it. I'll make a decision when the time comes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. And so far we have nobody joins has joined us yet, but we have a few minutes. I thought these were really great questions that came in. Yeah, yeah, they were. Yeah. And I know this is a really hot topic because so many people are starting to learn more about their genetics and some people have never known even what kind of mutation that they have and yeah so that's good that, that people are aware of it that they can and they, they can ask for their mutation and and maybe it tells them a bit more about what to expect so we'll yeah okay we got a couple people joining us hello welcome start in a few minutes we're just chatting here before we begin at noon or you know, five minutes from now, whatever time zone you're in. <laughs> Very exciting. Hello, Fran. Good to see you. Oh, my mom's here. Hey, mom. <laughs> I love this part. It's just fun seeing everybody come into the room. Oh, uh, Joy has raised her hand. I'm guessing you're just saying hello by raising your hand. <laughs> hello, but if uh, you're not saying hello and you have a question, be sure to put it in the Q&A box. We, we don't do anything other than with the hand raise other than know that you're either trying to ask us a question or trying to say hello, both of which are fine. <laughs> hello, Stacy, welcome. I think we should have like elevator music playing at this time when people are joining. Yeah. <laughs> Can everybody hear my dog barking? Dog? Yeah. <laughs> it's a bit like <laughs> elevator music. <laughs> Somebody rang the doorbell. <laughs> Fine. Great, more people are joining us. Welcome. We'll get started in a couple minutes. Sorry about the dog barking in the background. <laughs> Guess I have a good microphone or a very loud dog. Now 
we're up to 11 people, a couple minutes. I do want to introduce everybody to Bruno. He is managing the chat box today for us, and um, you'll see him there. So thank you, Bruno. No problem. Hi, everybody. And be sure to put your questions in the Q&A box. Um, I think a couple have come in on the chat box and I'll be monitoring the Q&A box during this session. So if there are any questions that come up for Dr. Von Villar, uh, please put them in the Q&A box. That will make sure that I see them. I think there's a couple names I haven't seen here before, which is great. Definitely some people I've met before or met virtually before, so welcome back. Great to see you again. And great to see new faces. Oh, I can't see your face, don't worry. But I can read your name and imagine. So good to see you. We'll get started in just a moment. Great, so we're about up to about 20, Ingrid. Ah, oh, great. 21 now. I would love to know how many people are attending from out of the country, for out of the US for this one. Very cool. I love that this brings everybody together internationally. So it is noon and we're gonna get started. I know that uh, more people are coming in and we're just gonna go ahead and get started. So welcome. Uh, if you don't know me, I'm Katie Wright. I'm the director of the VEDS Movement, which is a division of the Marfan Foundation. And if you haven't already met Bruno Da Silva, he is joining also from the Marfan Foundation and he will be managing the chat box for us today. Uh, this is week two of the International E3 Summit, which is brought to you by the Marfan Foundation and its divisions, the Lowy Steed Syndrome Foundation and the VEDS Movement educating, empowering, and enriching our community. This is also brought to you by our partners in Europe at the CERN. And we are very excited to be making history. Right now we have 2,680 registrants from 72 countries across the world, which makes this our largest event, I believe. So it's very, very exciting to get everybody from across the world engaged in this platform. So welcome from wherever you are. Um, not only do you come from all over the world, but you also represent several different conditions. And of course, this session is about vascular Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. We have 140 people registered from the VEDS community, which is very, very exciting. And I hope to see that number grow as time goes on and we engage with more people. So thank you so much for joining us. We are also very grateful to our presenting sponsors. Brigham and Women's Hospital and American Communications Construction for helping us bring this E3 Summit to you today. Just a note, the International E3 Summit is a forum to provide an open discussion of issues related to genetic aortic and vascular conditions. Opinions stated in each of these talks are those of the speakers, but not necessarily those of the Marfan Foundation or the CERN. So if you do have any questions or need clarification about the difference in opinions between session speakers, you can always feel free to contact us at marfan.org slash E3 ask and we welcome your, your questions. Just please be aware our health center is getting a lot of questions right now, so it might take a little bit of time to get back to you. Today we are very, very excited to have Dr. Ingrid Dandelar to join us today. If you would take a moment at the end of this session and provide your feedback. Um, on how this session was. We would really, really appreciate it. And I would like to give Dr. Vandalar an opportunity to say hello before we move on to her presentation. 
Well, good evening, everybody, to everybody listening from all over the world. It's really exciting to be able to uh, give a talk today on the genetics of vascular EDS. I think it's a really important topic uh, for all vascular EDS patients. Um, I work as a geneticist and I'm part of the aortic aneurysm team, so we see uh, many patients with uh, vascular EDS and other genetic conditions involved in aortic aneurysms. And I think the genetics is a really important part of it. So um, I'm happy to uh, explain a bit more about it today and uh, to take your questions uh, after the sessions. Thank you so much, Dr. Randler. And we will go ahead and uh, go right into the presentation. There will be time at the end of this presentation to answer questions. So if you have not already found the Q&A box, uh, please find it and submit your questions there. And we will be back after this uh, recorded presentation from Dr. Von Delar. So I'm going to go off video and so is Dr. Von Delar so that we can focus on the presentation. Today, I am pleased to present to you a short overview of the genetics of vascular Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. My name is Inge van der Laar. I am a clinical geneticist at the Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam, the Netherlands. And I am a member of the multidisciplinary expertise team on aortic disease in our hospital. We see patients with vascular Ehlers-Danlos, but also other thoracic aortic diseases. And I think that specialized genetic counseling is very important in this group of patients. And today, I hope to illustrate this by sharing with you some information on this complex topic. Vascular EDS is an autosomal dominant condition. What this means is illustrated by this figure. If one of the parents is affected by an autosomal dominant condition, like in this slide, the father, then the children have a 50% chance of inheriting the disease, regardless of sex. In approximately 50% of patients with vascular EDS, new mutations are found that occur only in one person in the family, so there's a lack of family history of the disease. These new mutations occur in the egg or the sperm cells of the parents or during the early stages of embryonic development. Vascular Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is most commonly caused by pathogenic variants in the COL3A1 gene. For the rest of my talk, it might be wise to explain a bit more about some basics of genetics. Our body is composed of cells. In each cell, our chromosomes are present and these chromosomes are composed of one large DNA strand. A piece of DNA is called a gene, like here the CoL3A1 gene. The CoL3A1 gene encodes for the protein collagen type 3. The protein is composed of hundreds and thousands amino acids, as shown here by the blue beads. Let me explain how this collagen 3 protein is processed in a normal situation. We have two copies of the col 3 one gene, one inherited from the father and one from the mother. Each gene makes protein change. Type 3 collagen is made up of three copies of this change and they form this perfect triple helix. The amino acid sequence of these chains is characterized by the amino acid glycine and two other amino acids named X and Y here. This glycine XY motifs are repeated 350 times and these allow for the correct folding of these three chains in the triple helix. The rope-like molecules are transported outside the cell and processed by enzymes that remove the ends of the molecules. Then the collagen molecules arrange themselves into long, thin fibrils that form stable interactions or crosslinks with one another. This results in the formation of very strong collagen fibers providing support 
into structures for tissues requiring tensile strength. Type 3 collagen is the major structural component in hollow organs such as blood vessels, uterus and bowel. How do we diagnose vascular EDS? With DNA analysis, we search for a disease-causing or pathogenic variant in the culture year one gene. We know the normal sequence of culture year one, and we search in the DNA of patients with signs of vascular EDS for abnormalities in the sequence. In this slide, you can see that the G in the normal sequence is replaced by a C in the abnormal sequence. How do we search for this abnormal sequence? Which techniques, also called molecular genetic tests, do we use? Individuals with uh, symptoms of EDS are likely to be diagnosed using gene-targeted testing. This consists of single gene testing with only the CoL3A1 gene or by multi-gene panel testing that includes CoL3A1 and other genes of interest that are included in the differential diagnosis of VEDS. Panel testing is most likely to identify the genetic cause of the condition while limiting identification of pathogenic variants in genes that do not explain the underlying phenotype. If no pathogenic variant is found, it is possible that a whole piece of DNA is absent or duplicated, and therefore we recommend to perform gene-targeted deletion or duplication analysis to detect intragenic deletions or duplications of the cold pa one gene. However, the phenotype of vascular EDS can be brought and patients with a phenotype indistinguishable from many other inherited connective tissue disorders or young children are more likely to be diagnosed using whole exome sequencing. By using whole exome sequencing, hundreds or thousands of genes are investigated all at the same time. This is less common, but might occur more often in the future since exome sequencing is used more widespread. Pathogenic variants in cold 3 a one can be clustered in three groups. The first and most common group is a single base substitution replacing one of the glycine residues of this triple helical domain and it's usually replaced by a larger amino acid. And so here the glycine is encircled by this red circle. The second group of variants are variants that cause splicing defects or in-frame insertion deletions or duplications. Let me explain this a bit more. So after transcription, genes consist of exons and introns. Exons are marked here by the purple bars and introns are in between. At RNA processing, these introns are spliced out and exons are put together. A splice variant, as shown here, is a variant that leads to aberrant splicing and this results in a shorter or a longer protein. So here you can see that exon 2 is spliced out by this splicing variant. This can also occur in variants that lead to in-frame insertions, deletions or duplications. The first two groups lead to a dominant negative effect on the protein. What is a dominant negative effect? I will explain this with the help of this figure. These pathogenic variants in one of the copies of the culture A1 gene lead to mutant chains. These mutant chains will be incorporated into the triple helices and lead to an interruption of the helical binding. This causes a disruption of the fibrous structure and results in a weakened tissue containing the mutant molecules. The third group are variants that cause half 
of the protein product. This is also called haploinsufficiency. This is illustrated by this drawing where you can appreciate that pathogenic variant cause absence of half of the protein. This generally results in the mild vascular EDS phenotype. This will be discussed in the talk by Peter Byers on September 9th. In total, 650 unique different pathogenic variants have been reported in Culture Year 1. There is a specific database that can be found via this website. If we look at the distribution of the different variants, we use the studies from Michael Frank among 146 index cases and Pepin among 572 index patients and we see that glycine substitutions occur most commonly and they account for 50 to 60 percent of cases. The splice variants occur in 30 percent of cases and the haploinsufficient variants occur in a minority of patients, only about 5 percent. If you want to know which variant is found in you or your family, you can ask the clinical geneticist involved or the doctor who ordered the DNA test for the results of the test. If we do DNA analysis, we can encounter different results. First, we can identify a pathogenic variant that's disease causing. It's also possible that no pathogenic variant is identified. In a minority of cases, we find a variant of unknown significance. This is also called a VUS or VUS. These variants are variants that can't be classified in one of the two other groups, and the clinical meaning of this variant is unclear. If a pathogenic variant is found in a patient, the patient can have disease-specific surveillance, management and treatment for the symptoms of vascular EDS. For individuals with clinical features consistent with vascular EDS, in whom no CULTRA1 mutation has been identified, one should consider another diagnosis that has clinical overlap with vascular EDS, like Lewis Dietz syndrome, or sometimes specific CUL1A1 variants that lead to a vascular EDS phenotype. Sometimes it's also worth to perform genome sequencing of the region, which can identify deep intronic variants this technique is not widely available. If not, one could inform whether it's possible to keep searching on a research basis. If a variant of unknown significance is identified, we recommend clinical investigation of family members. If other family members have clear signs or symptoms of vascular EDS, then DNA analysis can be performed. If the variant is absent in the affected family member, then the variant is probably not causing the disease. If the VUS is present in the affected family member, then it's more likely that the VUS is causing the disease, but still not 100% sure. Testing in multiple affected family members might be needed to reclassify a VUS to pathogenic. If the variant is predicted to affect splicing, then it's sometimes possible to perform a skin biopsy for characterization of the effect of the supply site alteration. We just mentioned that genetic testing is important for the patient, so the diagnosis can be confirmed and the patient can have disease-specific management, monitoring and treatment. Depending on the age of diagnosis, it can also help for choices regarding offspring. Another very important reason to perform genetic testing is that it can offer the option for genetic testing for family members. This is also called predictive testing. Therefore, it is of the utmost importance to inform family members once a diagnosis is made. However, if family members are confronted with a genetic disease and have no complaints, 
there are several considerations one can make before predictive DNA testing is performed. Some advantages of genetic testing are that people can get certainty about the presence or absence of the predisposition to disease. Individuals feel more in control. If they are not carrying the predisposition, then there is no unnecessary monitoring. It is important to know the diagnosis, since it is then possible to get optimal monitoring and treatment. I put treatment between brackets since we can't cure the disease, but we do can advise optimal care in case of complaints. By testing family members at risk, we know if their children or siblings are also at risk for the disease, so this allows further family testing. But there are also some disadvantages, like the burden of knowing you are carrying the predisposition that cannot be cured. It has psychological consequences and can cause fear and anxiety. But it can also lead to adjustments in lifestyle or possible limitations in work or sports due to symptoms. Another disadvantage is that it can have social consequences like stigmatization or discrimination in your job or insurance. Genetic counseling is offered to all patients with a strong suspicion of vascular EDS and family members for whom predictive DNA testing is performed. In these counseling sessions, several topics are discussed, like the cause and consequences of the disease, the inheritance pattern, the risk for children and other family members, the chance of developing symptoms of the disease, and together we explore the options for monitoring treatment and lifestyle. Depending on age, we will discuss the possibilities for pregnancy and the reproductive options, which I will come back to in my last slide. We will also talk on how to inform your family members and how we can help with the distribution of the information within the family. Based on all this information, one can decide for himself whether or not a DNA test is performed. There is no ready-made answer for this, and every individual has to make his own decision. This will also depend on personal experiences, the life stage that the person is in, and his or her future plans. Genetic counseling also includes discussing reproductive options. If a person has vascular EDS, there is a 50% chance of passing the predisposition to the next generation. So if that person has a wish to have a child, there are several options. One can accept the chance of having a child with vascular EDS. The child can be monitored and one can discuss with the genetic counselor what would be a good time to perform genetic testing in the child. On September 9th, Professor Lewis will have a session on the management of VEDS in children. One can also choose to do genetic testing during pregnancy. There are different options for invasive prenatal testing, like a chorion villi biopsy and amniocentesis. Both procedures have a small chance of miscarriage as a result of the procedure. A third option is pre-implantation genetic diagnostics. This means that genetic testing is done before pregnancy, and it's also called embryo selection. Lima Robert will give a talk on this on September 11th, so I won't go into detail. The last option is donation of an egg or a sperm by a donor. I would like to end my talk with a picture of our expertise team, with me in the bottom on the left. I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Vandelaar, for preparing that presentation. I'm going to go ahead and put my video back on, and if you would like to uh, join us as well on video for the Q&A session, we will go right into that. Um, there are some great questions in the Q&A box. 
And I know that as Dr. Von Delar mentioned in her presentation, there are several other presentations still coming up. So if your question is about, um, you know, deep into the variability between genetic mutations, I know that Peter Byers will be giving a presentation on that uh, next week and there are other sessions next week too. So don't fear if your question is not answered here, there are many other opportunities to get your question answered. Um, let's see if we can get Dr. Vandelar back on video here. And we have plenty of time for Q&A. So if you do have any questions you haven't asked yet, um, or if you put them in the chat box, please move those questions over to the Q&A box. Ah, there she is. Yeah. Hello. Hello. <laughs> We got you. So thank you so much for preparing that. I'm going to go ahead and start with some questions for you. Great. Okay. So I think the, the top questions so far are about the presence of any additional variants in col 3 a one that may have been found in the last few years that are known to cause VADs. Do you know if they've been updated? Yeah. So um, in total now there are yeah, more than 700 uh, variants found in col 3 a one in the last years. And um, uh, the majority of these variants, they are private variants. So each patient has his own variant and some variants are present in multiple families, uh, but most of the variants are unique. Um, and as I told you in the presentation, and most of the variants occur in this glycine uh, triplet. And this triplet is repeated over 300 times, so many different um, residues can be affected in the protein. So many different variants can occur in this col 3 a one gene. And so this number continues to increase every year. Okay. How would you recommend somebody find out their specific genetic mutation if they don't know which one they have? Yeah, I think it's, uh, if you'd like to know which variant is identified, you can always contact the physician who ordered the DNA test. Um, we often write a letter to the patient where the specific mutation is mentioned. Uh, but if this is not the case, then it's good to, um, to contact the physician involved or at least the physician who ordered uh, the test. Um, most commonly it's the clinical geneticist, but sometimes also other uh, specialists order the DNA test. Um, so it depends on who ordered the test. Thank you. And I see a couple of people have raised their hand. I can't do anything uh, to address the hand raising from this end, but if you could put your question in the Q&A box, um, I can look at those questions there. So thank you for raising your hand. I think this is a very exciting topic and um, really appreciate your, your time here. So is there, let's see, there's a two questions in one here. So I'll start with one and then I'll move to the next. Do you know of any teams working with col 3 a one non-glycine missense variants located in the triple helix? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I know that these um, non-glycine missense variants in the triple helix are quite rare. Um, they have been included in some uh, studies that have been published. So um, usually most studies include all different variants that are found in col 3 a one and they're usually not just focused on, uh, for example, the glycine uh, substitutions that occur most frequently. Um, but these uh, type of variants, they are rare and um, uh, I don't know what the reason for the question is, but we do, um, if we look at, at the small numbers that we have, we it seems that there is a, a milder clinical cause in these, um, in, in per persons with these variants. But um, ha it's still important that these uh, patients are, um, monitored because they still can have, uh, they still are at risk for arterial events. So um, we can't um, adjust the follow-up based on the genetic uh, variant that is found. And the numbers are too small to make 
an individual recommendation for monitoring. Um, Okay, I think that answered the, the question, actually, the second part of the question was, how do you recommend following symptomatic patients who have that kind of VUS variant? Yeah, so, so I think it should be similar to all other patients with uh, vascular EDS based on cold ta one uh, variants. So we can't, uh, the groups are too small to individualize um, uh, the advices for monitoring or the, the recommendations for monitoring. Okay, thank you very much. And I know that there are very specific variant questions in the Q&A. I believe, you know, I talked to Dr. Von Delar about this and we think that the best way to get those questions answered would be to submit your question to our Help and Resource Center. Um, that way we can get a more personalized answer to that question. And you can do that through marfan.org slash e3ask. Yeah, maybe it is important to mention that uh, um, it's it's always difficult to predict um, uh, the outcome uh, uh, for specific individuals based on the variant. So we we do see um, differences in um, the risk for complications or uh, for survival in in groups with specific variants. But these differences are also based on really large um, groups of patients and, and they can't be used to counsel individuals uh, because there's so much uh, variability within some families, but also between families uh, with the same pathogenic variants. So we see based on, on these families that we can't use it for indivi individual counseling. Thank you. And Dr. Peter Byers will be talking about variability within families and on September, I actually think it's September 8th. It's next Tuesday. I believe. Okay. Um, so if, you know, if you have those types of questions, that might be a very good presentation to attend and also submit your question to our Help and Resource Center. Like Dr. Bandelier mentioned, it's, it's very difficult to make recommendations based on a specific mutation because our sample sizes are very small. So for someone who's tested positive for Marfan syndrome, um, but also has some overlapping uh, symptoms with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, is it possible to have both? Uh, well, in, in theory, theory, it's possible to have two genetic conditions, but I think that there's um, a lot of overlap between Marfan and uh, EDS or vascular EDS. Uh, so some symptoms are um, quite similar and therefore we also um, uh, now usually do these uh, panel testing where many genes are included and many genes are tested. So not only um, uh, we look for one diagnosis, but we also look for the other uh, genes because sometimes it's really difficult based on the uh, clinical presentation to know which condition um, a, a person has. So um, it is possible to have two genetic conditions, but I think it's more likely that, um, yeah, that that the, the symptoms fit with Marfan syndrome and, and overlap with the symptoms described in EDS. Thank you. And for someone, we talked about this one a little bit before the presentation. So for someone who has tested positive for vascular EDS with one heterozygous mutation in col 3 a one but also has polymicrogyria and sunken eyes. Is it possible that there is another col 3 a one mutation that is missing that you could find using whole exome sequencing? Would you think that is necessary? Yeah, that's um, a, a really specific uh, question. Um, uh, I, I do understand uh, 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 why this is being asked because um, yeah, we know in uh, people with a heterozygous variant, they have features of vascular EDS. And some people who have uh, a compound heterozygous, so two variants in the col 3 a one gene, they have symptoms of vascular EDS, but they can also have this polymicrogyria. And um, yeah, what I understand from the question is that there's only one variant found now. So uh, 
um, yeah, is it possible that we missed the second variant? That's always possible. I mean, our techniques are really good and exome sequencing is really good, but still you can miss these deep intronic variants. So um, I think it's, it's good to, uh, to also look um, with all genome sequencing, although it's not always possible to do it. Not everybody, um, or not in every lab, this technique is available. Um, but if it's available, then I think it's good to look if there's a second variant. And if it's not available, then maybe, um, yeah, someone can take it along who does research on this topic and um, can have a, a closer look at the, um, at the whole gene and also the intronic uh, sequences. Um, um, it's also possible that that's um, in a patient with only one variant in cold VA1, this polymicrogyria occurs. Uh, so it's good to look for the second variant, but um, if that is not found, also not with the uh, with whole genome sequencing, then it's still, uh, I think it's still possible that it's, it um, belongs also to the, to the phenotype that occurs in heterozygous patients. Because yeah, we've seen it before also in patients with only uh, a heterozygous variant. It's really rare, but we, we have seen it before. Could you describe briefly for people who aren't familiar with, the, with that terminology, what that means? The polymicrogyria, you mean? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I can explain it. It's a um, uh, condition of the, of the brain. Um, and we see uh, that the winding of the brain is, is different. So it's um, a congenital abnormality, uh, actually. Okay. Thank you for, for, I had never heard that term before myself, and I'm sure I, that there are I can before. imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so where is the, let's see, what is the best layperson non-expert resource to learn more about genetics and beds? Is there, I mean, I think this is a really good forum for that. Do you have any other recommendations for people? Um, to learn more about genetics in vascular EDS? Um, well, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of uh, medical literature, um, but that's usually not really uh, easy to read, especially not if it's about genetics. Um, and as far as I know, there, there are no really good um, websites for uh, specific for vascular EDS, we do have in the Netherlands and I'm sure also in many other countries, there are websites where uh, you can find general information on genetics and inheritors of uh, genetic conditions. Um, but usually it's not uh, specialized for vascular EDS. So, um, I know that we have a we have a website, thevedsmovement.org, that has information about beds. And I think a genetics and genetic testing brochure is on our to-do list of like big ticket items that I think would be helpful for this community. Yeah. So maybe that is something that you can look out for in the future from the beds movement and we can uh, collaborate and make sure that it is as understandable as possible for somebody without a genetics background. I think that would sounds like it would be very valuable for people. So um, thank you for asking that question. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. It's really, really great. Highlights the, the reason why we need this. Would you be able to explain how a person can um, see if they are mosaic for vascular Ehlers-Danlos syndrome? And for people who are not familiar with mosaicism, can you describe what that means? Yeah, so what um, mosaicism means is that um, a, a specific genetic uh, variant is not present in all cells, but only in part of the cells. And um, this can be only in um, the germline, so uh, the egg or the sperm cells, but it can be also, you can also be mosaic in parts of your body. Um, 
we do a DNA test with um, the white blood cells from our, uh, from our blood. So that's where we look for uh, pathogenic variants involved in vascular EDS. Um, so in the blood, uh, you can sometimes also see that only part of these white blood cells have the variant and, and a part of the white blood cells has the normal uh, sequence. So sometimes you find mosaicism uh, by doing this blood test. Um, but if you have a really strong suspicion of mosaicism, then you should also look at other tissues, for example, um, fibroblasts, so skin, you can do a skin biopsy or, um, um, or in urine, you can look at, uh, at uh, presence of a certain uh, genetic condition. So that, these are ways to look if there's, there might be a mosaic uh, uh, condition uh, present. Is that also present in a saliva test or only the blood and urine and skin? Saliva is also a possibility, yeah. But it's always, yeah, you can only look at um, uh, tissues that are easily uh, available. Yeah, so sometimes you really want to know if it's, for example, in... Uh, in your vessels or uh, uh, in your heart, but you can't investigate these tissues. So you can only look at the tissues that are easily accessible. Thank you. After a confirmed diagnosis, should a child still be seen by a genetic counselor or just their normal doctors? Yeah, what we usually do is if, uh, if we um, uh, confirm a diagnosis at a young age, then these children are followed up by um, uh, the other members of the team. And we usually see them by the age of 18 to explain a bit more about uh, the recurrence risks and the possibilities for future children. Um, yeah, so we think it's, it's good to see them again uh, before um, they go to uh, the adult uh, team um, to inform them about the possibilities for, um, for future uh, children. Yeah, but they, they, if there's no questions about um, uh, genetics or uh, testing of family members or how to communicate the results of genetic tests to the child or uh, if there's no specific questions for genetics, then there's no reason to, uh, to visit uh, uh, a clinical geneticist. Okay. So I think this is a very good question. So for someone with a variant, a type 4 col 3 a one mutation, uh, like what you mentioned in your presentation, can they have other types of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome other than the vascular type? Or would it be specific for events? Um, sorry, can you repeat it again, the question? Yes, I think during your presentation you were talking about um, uh, haploinsufficiency, glycine mutations, and splice site mutations, mm -hmm. and then you also talked about a fourth type of, of uh, mutation that can cause VEDS. Is it possible that somebody with that fourth type can have a different form of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome than VEDS? Yeah, we do see in in uh, some specific variants that um, uh, the phenotype uh, looks more like another type of vascular or of EDS than to the classic type of vascular EDS. So uh, it is possible we still um, call it vascular EDS, and we still recommend screening or monitoring um, as for patients with vascular EDS. But the phenotype can really uh, fit more into one of the other types of vascular EDS. So yeah, that's a good a good question, um, and it's I can uh, imagine that it's uh, confusing. Um, but we still believe that if the variant is in col one one, then we should monitor according to um, at the same. Uh, uh, recommendations as for other patients with vascular EDS. Okay. So how would you determine the pathogenicity of a VUS variant and somebody who's symptomatic but has a milder case 
in which they cannot test other family members. I think you talked about this a little bit when we're talking about determining whether or not a VUS can be bumped up to pathogenic and yeah. testing other family members. How would you do it if there aren't any? Yeah, I think that's the, that's the biggest challenge for uh, the clinical geneticist in the coming, uh, in the coming years. So um, and now we're um, testing a lot more frequently. We do many more genetic testing in, in patients and we find buses more often. Um, and it's, it's challenging to, um, to classify these variants. Um, and we don't have many tools available at the moment. So one of the tools is the segregation within the family. So to look for other family members if it's a certain variant that might affect splicing then we can do this skin biopsy and see um, or if it affects um, um, uh, has effects on the protein then we sometimes can do a skin biopsy um, and sometimes we we just don't know and we have to advise that patients come back in a few years time and we hope that by that time, the variant has been found more often. Therefore, it's also important that all variants are, um, are put into a database so everybody can see which variants are found. Um, and maybe a variant is by the time found more frequently than in the normal population. And then we can say, okay, now we see it more frequently in the normal population. So probably this is not pathogenic. So sometimes um, time will teach us what the VAS means and we have no other tools available. Okay, thank you. For someone who was just diagnosed recently with vascular Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and has an appointment with a geneticist or a genetic counselor soon, what questions would you recommend that they ask at that appointment? Um, Yeah, I think it's important um, yeah, if you go to the geneticist and if the diagnosis is already made, um, yeah, you might have heard already um, from the uh, specialist who ordered the tests what it means to have vascular EDS, but it's, that's always one of the important parts of genetic counseling yeah, to learn more about the condition uh, and what it means for you and for um, yeah, for the future um, and I think it's always important to um, to talk about uh, what it means for your family members yeah? so that's an important part that um, is being discussed in a genetic counseling uh, session and it's always important to ask for uh, the risks for your family members okay I think that's great it's so it's such a a really wild time when you first get that diagnosis too. Yeah. So, so many things going on at that time. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine that it's, uh, there are so many questions and so many um, things you'd like to know. And it's always really difficult to predict what this means for your future and, and how this condition will, will um, uh, yeah, will affect you uh, um, so th that's something that we can't we can't predict but we we do can uh, talk in general about what what it means to have vascular EDS uh, and what it can mean for your family members thank you I think some of the questions that we have left are very there's a couple of them that are very specific about their very specific mutation and we talked about getting that answered through our Help and Resource Center. Um, variability questions are going to be, I believe, answered by Dr. Peter Byers next week. Did you want to answer any of the um, variability questions? I think, I don't see other ones that have come in. And we've reached those. <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, there's a lot to, uh, to tell about this variability. So, um, we can spend a whole uh, hour for that. Uh, mm -hmm. So maybe it's good to, uh, to listen to the presentation of Peter Byers to hear a bit more about that. I think the whole uh, session is about uh, the variability and, uh, and the, the genotype-phenotype correlation uh, 
of certain variants. Okay. So we do have one more that has come in. If you have any other questions, please submit them to the Q&A, uh, keeping in mind that the specific variability questions we will ask in the presentation by Dr. Peter Byers and give him an opportunity to present on it as well. Um, for uh, This is a follow-up question for mosaicism. Does it does it, did you mean that they have to test a specific organ to check for mosaicism? Uh, yeah, I don't know what the exact background of this question is. So um, I talked a bit more in general about uh, what uh, mosaicism is and how you can find out if someone is mosaic for uh, a genetic condition. Um, for Vesco EDS specific, I, I'm not aware of descriptions of mosaicism. Um, I think so, so I'm getting some clarification. Um, I think what they mean is, would it only be present in the skin or only in a certain organ? Like, can you be tested for mosaic, for mosaic mutate or mosaic cells somewhere in the body? and test negative in one place in the body and then to test positive in another? Yeah, so in theory it's possible, but I haven't heard of, of these um, such as uh, uh, specific mosaicism for vascular EDS. Okay. So I'm not aware that it exists, but okay. in theory it's always possible that yeah, you have a certain variant in, in a specific tissue and for certain conditions we really know that it occurs more frequently but I'm not aware that this is also the case in vascular EDS. Okay, thank you. Um, have you heard of any major changes or new findings in genetics regarding vascular Ehlers-Danlos syndrome this year? Um, no, not specific for vascular EDS. I mean there's a lot of things uh, occurring within genetics. Um, yeah, so many new techniques have become available and many genetic conditions are being investigated to see if we can uh, start disease specific treatment or uh, gene specific treatment or maybe even mutation specific treatment. Um, but for vascular EDS, uh, I haven't heard uh, about these um, uh, things in in uh, in the past year, um, so it will be the future, I think, but it will be the far future. So that will not be something that will become available in the near future. Okay. Well, I think uh, we've reached. Oh, we've get We're getting more questions. In. <laughs> I love this. This is great. Okay, so let's see. How should I word this question? If the prevalence of VEDS is higher than we know today, um, isn't it a risk to oversee or exclude the milder cases when determining VUS if you decide based on the prevalence in genome AD? Um, and the last part of the question, so um, it was about the prevalence of Vascular EDS mm -hmm. and the mild phenotypes? Uh, yeah, I think they're asking that if you, like, should we be ex excluding? I think the, the, the assumption behind this question, I think, is that we are potentially excluding milder cases when determining the significance of a VUS. Oh, yeah, I, I think I, I uh, understand what the question is. So, because um, you mentioned also GNOMAT uh, in the question, yeah. So if we look at the VUS, then we have certain criteria where we look to to see if the variant can be pathogenic or not. Eh? So we use all kind of uh, computer programs, and one of the uh, criteria is that if it present in uh, the normal population, if it's frequent in the normal population, then we expect that it's not pathogenic. And, and this uh, normal population um, uh, is found in GNOMAT. Yeah? So that's what, what this person is talking about. But if the phenotype is really mild, then a person might not 
know that he has vascular EDS and be present in this normal control population. So maybe we exclude the vas based on what's present in GNOMAT, um, but that wouldn't be fair. Yeah, because maybe there's there's a really someone with a really mild phenotype who doesn't know that he has this genetic condition. Um, yeah, so uh, we know that that that's a risk. Yes, if we only look at this normal control population and we exclude it based on that, but usually the frequency of a variant um, does tell us something. So if a variant is present in in a high frequency in the normal control population, yeah, then we don't think that all these patients have a really mild vascular EDS phenotype. Um, but if a variant is really rare in GNOMAP, then yeah, you can never exclude that someone has a mild phenotype of vascular EDS and is not aware of it. Or maybe it's a young person who didn't have any complaints until now. Um, yeah, so if a variant is really rare, then it's still good to have a closer look at it to see if the variant is not pathogenic. Um, okay. Thank you very much. I hope that was a, I hope that was the question that I yeah. asked you right. <laughs> yeah, that's difficult. That we can't. Question. Yeah. I really, I think that was, that was right. Um, let's see. We just have a variability questions. And then, um, and maybe this would be a good final question if no more come in. What would you, as a geneticist, do you know the best way for us to advocate for more research on beds? Very general question, but um, yeah. maybe from your perspective, it would, be, it would be nice to hear. So the question is whether, whether we, whether, what's the best place to go to for uh, research on vascular EDS? Yeah, how do we advocate for more research? Advocate for more research. Oh, yeah, that's always, um, it's a good question. And uh, it's also a really difficult question because we know that if something's rare, it's always difficult to, um, uh, yeah, to have a lot of research being done for, for the condition. Uh, but I think we're getting um, uh, more attention also for rare diseases uh and so um yeah it's it, it's still uh people are becoming more aware that also for the rare diseases although they're rare altogether um a lot of people have rare diseases so it's also important to focus on those diseases and also because sometimes if we if we do research on these rare diseases it can also be used for uh, more common conditions yeah? so we can also learn us a lot about uh, more common conditions for example aneurysms in general yeah? so um yeah it's it's uh, but but where or who we should go to to get it done that's um yeah that's a difficult question i can't answer that <laughs> and i imagine it's it's different kind of all over the world to where you advocate like what the best route for advocating for that is, is going to be different depending yeah. on where you live and what kind of government you have and everything too. So, yeah, yeah, that's also true. And also uh, some uh, governments give a lot of research for rare diseases and others are a bit more strict. So um, yeah, it's depending on the, on the research agenda in your country also. Yes. So um, thank you so much for your time. I think that is going to be the end of the Q&A today. Uh, if you did not get your question answered, please don't, um, don't fear. We will do our best to get your question answered either through Peter Byers' session next week on variability in beds or through our um, help center at marfan.org slash e3ask. So, Feel free to answer, ask your question there, especially if it was a very specific question about a specific mutation. I think that's probably the best way to get that answered because we can contact the experts directly um, for that to get them in contact with you. So if you could complete the session survey for this session, we would really, really appreciate it. I showed you where that was earlier. 
And I hope that you spend a lot of time connecting with community and going to some of the other sessions that we have available through the Whova app. I think it's a, it's a very buzzing place right now. I think there's something like over 8,000 messages or something that have been sent. I've, it's very cool to see all the engagement. So thank you for joining us today. Share your experience on social media by using the hashtag E3Summit20. And we will be looking out for that hashtag online. We really, really appreciate your time today. And if you want to help us make more programming like this possible, you can always visit markhan.org slash donate. Thank you so much again, Dr. Yvonne Delar. I really, really appreciate your time and, and your expertise. You're welcome. It was nice. Uh, it was nice to do this. So thank you very much. And thank you for all the nice questions. Thank you. And thank you everybody for joining us and have a great rest of your day or evening, wherever you are. Okay, bye. Bye.